welcome to the Tabernacle. Uh, for those of you who haven't been here before, I know the feeling. It's amazing, isn't it? It's an absolutely extraordinary space. Um, John and I were just talking before we started about how long we'd known each other. We've just met. Um, <laughs> we had just met 40 years ago. Um, we were both student politicians together. Um, you were Southampton, weren't you, yep. John? Yeah. I was the president of the union, and you were president of the National Union of Students. That's what I wanted him to say. You were the big <laughs> guy, so. I just looked up to you. That's right, that's right. Well, now the position is entirely reversed. <laughs> yeah. Um, and John is the Alistair Cook de nos jours. Um, uh, he told me he's having to fight off young people in the BBC who want his birth, so I told him just to say, I am... Alastair Cook for now, and <laughs> I plan to go on to... How old was he? 93? <laughs> he was a good age. He was a good age, well, John's kind of. Um So, obviously, a lot of you, uh, all of you probably, have seen John on the television or heard him on the radio uh, talking about uh, uh, America, and people will have seen him before, um, uh, when he was a political correspondent uh, and when he was in Europe uh, and so on. So he's, he's, he's covered the waterfront. Actually horribly looks younger now than he was he looked when he was a political correspondent which is hardly surprising since he was famous with his colleague Mark Mardell for extremely long and indiscreet lunches with cabinet ministers and so on there was a there was a photo the BBC reran on BBC Parliament yesterday coverage of the 1997 election uh, I would suggest that it did show that I went out for rather too many lunches. <laughs> the picture they put out on Twitter, the pictures came up of me of, from 1997. So anyway, yeah, so that was yeah. too, mu too many lunches with Mark Mardell. Yeah, let's pass that over quickly. Um, anyway, so this is, this is John's book that he's come back from America with. He's come back from America with a gift, which you have to pay for. Um, <laughs> Mia showing that you have a BBC licence isn't sufficient to get you this book. You have to shell out tw 20 quid, not even £19.99. Um, uh, but it is worth it, I assure you. But we're going to talk about it uh, now. Um, the the title, main title of the book is If Only They Didn't Speak English, John. So I'm just going to ask you to explain the title. Um, it was after the terrible shootings in Orlando at the Pulse nightclub. And I think for about the seventh or eighth time on the air that day, I had been asked, so, does this mean there's going to be a radical change in US gun law? And I, each time I just want to say, no, not going to happen. And you have to go through the explanation. And I, I was talking to our bureau chief in Washington. Um, I was talking about, it's just kind of, it's one of those frustrating areas where our views and our values on that issue are so totally different. That, and, he, and he replied, yeah, he says, if only they didn't speak English, we'd treat it as a foreign country. And I thought, there's a title there. And, and then I kind of started conceptualising all, all the other areas, some of them obvious, maybe others of them less obvious, where if only they didn't speak English, we would look at this country with a kind of an eye accepting that it is foreign and not just part of the UK. And whether it's... So in each chapter, I've tried to do something on, you know, so guns on God. I mean, you know, the religion plays such an important part in public life in a country which is a republic where there is no established church. Uh, you, uh, race is still so different. Government, people's attitudes towards government, patriotism, uh, are just so different from the UK. And living, I'd, I'd travelled a lot in America, and um, I even drove a Harley Davidson across the west coast of America, which was the most fantastic midlife crisis with four other guys. And, um, and I say that with my wife here and my son here, so there was nothing untoward about it, but just motorbikes. Uh, and what was it, the point of it? There was nothing untoward <laughs> about it. <laughs> there was one night in Vegas. Okay, but anyway, moving on. Um, Stays in Vegas. Uh, there, the, the, and I kind of thought I really knew this country well, and I'd gone there for work loads of times, and we'd had family holidays there. And then you go and live there, and there are all th sorts of things that strike you. I mean, it's kind of silly little things, like you know, basic courtesy, decency, civility. You know, in the office, the young staff call me sir. I had never been called sir in the BBC until that moment. Um, people on the street, you know, when I'm walking the dog in the morning, uh, say, you know, hi, how are you? Morning. And you go on your way. And I, we came back to Washington, uh, my wife Linda is here, and we brought the dog back um, for a couple of months. 
And I would walk up Primrose Hill, and it was like I was suddenly invisible because no one had said hello to you anymore. Now, those are small things, but there were also, the book is about the much bigger things that kind of, you know, divide us and also, in a way, divide America as well. Uh, I think the problem is you've just been away too long, John. Uh, you're allowed to say hello if the somebody, other person has a dog too. Oh. But otherwise you don't. Yeah, but because. they do. They do in America. See? Yeah, I know. That's, it, uh, it is peculiar. So, so you have to get used to kind of... And you don't get into a... T you know, in, uh, one thing I learned is in, in London, you get into a cab, you say, Charing Cross Station, and in, in Washington, you get in and say, hi, how are you? That goes against all my instincts. I am normally getting into a cab because I'm in a hurry and I'm feeling stressed. And it's normally to get down to the White House to do a live for the 10 o'clock news. Whereas you go, hi, how are you? And they go, fine, how are you? And you go, great. And then you say, can you take me to the corner of 16th and Penn, please? And, you know, and then you're on your way. Yeah, it sounds awful. Um, <laughs> and, uh, also, and less, I think, also I think... less cynical, David. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, we'll talk about, we'll talk about uh, Trump and conspiracy theories in a moment uh, when it comes to the question of uh, cynicism. Um, John, if you had... Uh, your, your book, Scott, uh, is split into several uh, very uh, relevant chapters, um, the, such as anger and race and guns, and all of them seem to me to be apropos and to be asking the, the right questions. Um, but first, tell me, if you'd been writing this book four years ago, just after the re-election of Barack Obama uh, in 2012, his re-inauguration uh, in 2013, do you think it would have been anything like this book? No. Uh, straight after the inauguration, uh, people were talking about America as a post-racial society. People were talking about the kind of, you know, had the problems gone away? No, but were people looking in a different direction? Yes. And so people, so on the issue of race, for example, people were looking uh, in another direction. There was an, an African-American president. It seemed that the kind of big divides of race uh, were over. And then you get in a place called Ferguson, who'd ever heard of Ferguson, Missouri, the most extraordinary explosion of violence after an 18-year-old black kid is uh, gunned down a number of times by a white police officer. Um, and the way the community reacted and the way the police reacted. And I was, I went, I was sent to cover it. And you know, suddenly I'm in Ferguson, Missouri, wearing a gas mask, and there is kind of you know, tear gas, and there are stun grenades, and there is live ammunition being fired as well. And you're thinking, no, this is... And, and all the protesters were black, and all the police were white. And you just thought, wow, things haven't changed anything like as much as maybe uh, you thought it had. Um, it's like there was a slow burn reaction to the financial crisis of 2008, which you know, a lot of people come to see as representing you know, the low point, if you like, of, uh, of globalization, where kind of, you know, uh, the, the subprime market in America caused a contagion around the world. And um, in 2012, people were still thinking the American dream was working that if you lived in Youngstown, Ohio, the jobs in the steel industry were about to come back. If you lived in Blue Ridge in Georgia, the textile jobs were going to come back. If you lived in Chicago and you were working at the Nabisco food factory, you thought the jobs were going to come back. But as time went on, and more and more jobs were sent offshore, manufacturing was sent to Mexico or the Philippines or Vietnam or wherever it was, people suddenly started to think, Unemployment, which had always been a part of the condition of America, was suddenly permanent. And people got angrier and angrier. And in the, in the Wall Street Journal or the Financial Times, they would talk about GDP growth. And people would say, uh, would carry on as if everything was fine in the US economy. And people were bowling along quite merrily. And actually, people were getting more and more resentful. And Donald Trump, like a genius, tapped into that anger that had lain beneath, beneath the surface and hadn't been seen. But all that, almost all of that, was true by 2013. But it hadn't come to the surface. Yeah, so talk, to, so talk me through the coming to the surface bit. The coming to the surface bit was that there was... Uh, so, for example, I mean, D Donald Trump, when he set out his election strategy, people thought it was for the birds. I am going to bring in all the people, the dispossessed, the people who've never voted before, they're going to turn out 
and they're going to vote for me because I offer this populist, America first, nativist agenda uh, where we're going to build a wall with Mexico, where we're going to keep Muslims out, where we're going to just focus on the US economy. He did. He got record numbers of Republicans voting for him in those primaries. No one, I mean, you know, there are times where we may come on to discuss this, where maybe Donald Trump has exaggerated the truth to the point of breaking. Um, this he wasn't exaggerating. This was true. And these people came out and they suddenly thought that they had a voice. And until then, they had been alienated, felt dispossessed, didn't go anywhere near the political process, didn't vote. They sat watching Fox TV or right -wing, looking at right-wing conspiracy websites, thinking America is broken and they don't want to have any part of it. And Donald Trump gave voice to a lot of those people, and it was a lot of instinct. Uh, it wasn't based on focus group research. It was based on a lot of what... I, I remember, sorry, I remember one story that I was in uh, Iowa before the Iowa caucus, and at one of these huge out-of-town churches, I met uh, Donald Trump Jr., and interviewed him, and he said, the thing you have to understand about my dad, he's just a blue-collar worker with a better bank balance. And you think, yeah, by a few billion dollars, actually. But um, yeah, uh, and, and I think there is a truth in that. Okay. You look at me disbelieving. Um, no, I don't look at you disbelievingly. It's just that um, it is hard to believe that somebody who has never had to struggle in his entire life for anything that he has ever had, ever, can really be inside the skin of somebody who has nothing and struggles for absolutely everything they get always. Um, uh, and, and, and that raises the question of the kind of, not the trick, but the, but the way of communicating but the, uh, and the communication, the, the way in which he has of getting these people to identify with the thing that he cannot conceivably ever have been. I don't buy his son's bullshit, of course, and I, I wouldn't buy any of that bullshit. Uh, so it's a good phrase, and he, and he kind of tells it. Um, so maybe we, should, maybe we should talk about the alchemy that allows him to sh suggest to people that he somehow expresses their desires, people he has nothing in common you with. You see, well, I, mean, I, no, I understand that. I mean, it, it, you know, bewildering to me as a British person, and again, you know, this is the, the kind of the theme of the book about the difference. I mean, can we imagine in Britain uh, a billionaire businessman who's got his own private jet with gold plate taps in the bathrooms and ludicrous leather upholstered furniture around his boardroom table on the plane, who boasts about playing no taxes, uh, who says that, um, I mean, let's not even get onto the Access Hollywood tapes where some of the unspeakable things he said about what he was able to do with women just because he was in a position of power. Could anybody like that get elected to become our Prime Minister? I just, I don't think it's possible. Um, so, but America has a different view towards wealth. I mean, I, you know, he has managed to create this story that somehow he is the embodiment of the American dream, which of course is absolute arrant nonsense because he got a huge gift from his father, managed to get five deferments from going to Vietnam, and uh, was pretty handsomely set up as a very young man. Yeah, you know, he may have done well since then, but he is not the kind of rags to riches story that he would uh, like some people to think. I think what it was, was that he just identified that people were fed up with immigration, they were fed up about their lack of jobs. I mean, you know, if you ask Donald Trump in detail how is he going to bring manufacturing jobs back, I mean, I just do not see the Remington typewriter factory reopening. <laughs> Things have moved on, and I cannot see as well that he is going to uh, bring back Eastman Kodak film processing laboratories. I do not see either that there is going to be steel making in any sizable sense because those jobs have gone for an economic reason. And you know, there's a very good micro example uh, of Apple. The argument was made by Obama. Why can't you manufacture the iPhone in the USA? To which Steve Jobs replied, there's no way. When we wanted to make a, a redesign on a new product, there were 2,000 Chinese workers sleeping in a dormitory next to the factory. We woke them up, we gave them tea and a biscuit, and they got to work that night so that we could have it back in America three days later. Are you going to tell me I can get labor like that in the USA? Not a chance. 
also, the price of it is such that everyone has got an iPhone, has got a smartphone now. Whereas, if it was made in America, it would be an elite instrument. And so, you know, America can have America first and made in America, which is obviously one of the big Donald Trump, although none of his products, it's worth noting, that are on sale are, are made in America. Um, but, you know, if you are kitting out your kids for school, do you go to Walmart and buy one pair of trousers for $80 that are made in America, or eight pairs of trousers for $10 each that are made in the Philippines? I think I know what the answer is. So I just don't, I don't see that this kind of transformation, the way he tells it, is going to come back. Just let me put one other point. What really also struck me, which I thought was so unusual, when I've experienced anger, in politics, where you cover people are fed up about this or they're fed up about that. Normally, with anger goes cynicism. And with Donald Trump, they just think, oh my God, he's going to do this. He's going to transform America. I, I have a vivid recollection of going to this dirt track race in, in southern Georgia. Every single person, and I was doing the classic BBC thing of trying to do vox pops with people. Excuse me, how are you going to vote? Excuse me, how are you going to vote? Yeah, I why think, do you do that? I know, it's <laughs> grammar of television. It's so irritating. David, am I right in thinking you used to be my boss in the BBC? Yeah, I was always trying to get you not yeah. to do that sort of yeah. stuff. So, uh, the, the, you know, every single person, every single person, we couldn't find one person supporting Hillary Clinton. Everyone was supporting Donald Trump because they all believed that he had the answer. He was going to make America great again. He was going to bring back manufacturing. He was going to stop illegal immigration. He was going to sort out, you know, and, and I just thought, that's really unusual that people could be so angry I don't want to say gullible, let's see, time will tell, uh, but just seemed to kind of believe without any cynicism whatsoever that he would be able to achieve this. Well, we'll talk, about, we'll talk a bit more about gullibility in a moment. Um, so here's the proposition uh, for you, which, uh, which is this. Perhaps they don't believe he's going to do those things. Perhaps that's not really the point. Perhaps the point is actually going back to Ferguson, Missouri, that he represents a kind of older impulse which they feel has been, they've been forced out of, that they've been, that's been destroyed for them. Yeah, let's be, unpack that. Are you saying, suggesting he's kind of a white nationalist? I, I don't, I don't want uh, to use no, term, I'm, not, I don't, I'm not saying that as a kind no, of I don't want argumentative to use term, way. White, white nationalist is actually a very modern phrase. Uh, and I'm talking about something much older. One of the things that is really good, I think, in your chapter on race is the amount of uh, emphasis you give to the Reconstruction period of Reconstruction. A period we know very fantastically little yeah. about in Britain. We think, more or less, you go from the emancipation of the slaves to civil rights, and somehow or other, in the intervening hundred years, something or other happens. We don't know that President Woodrow Wilson instituted the great Democrat League of Nations, although America didn't join, instituted segregation for the American Federal in, uh, Administration. That after 1880, as you p quite rightly detail in the book, there was a rollback on rights for black people across lots of states of the United States, and not just some of the southern states and so on, which can, now we did rediscovered this period during the statute during Charlottesville. Yeah. Because all of a sudden we began talking about when a lot of these statues were built and what they actually represented and so on. And you, and you then got an idea of the irreconcilability. But it's striking to me, and I said this to you uh, before, that when you deal with a chapter on anger, the people who are angry are white. When you deal with a chapter on race, the people who are talking about race are black. And yet, presumably, those whites have an attitude to race as well. Yeah. So they, there's, there's, there's not so much a proposition, but something for you to play yeah, with. Yeah, and that, so, the, I mean, one of the really interesting things I found when, you know, in that sort of throughout 2016, when you're on the road and you're traveling to all these kind of weird and wonderful places in America, uh, with terrible airports and terrible kind of, you know, the life on the road uh, in America sounds glamorous when you go into all these places and you arrive at the place and you think, oh my goodness, it's not quite as gorgeous as you had, had mentally thought it would be. Um, every, the, one of the common refrains I heard from people was, Donald Trump says what I'm thinking, but I can't say. He says what is on their minds. He is their id. He kind of, he, he's, you know, he articulates what an awful lot of people are thinking. 
and a lot of what people are thinking, I mean, you know, I thought, I thought Hillary Clinton was a lousy candidate. I mean, she didn't have a message. Uh, she couldn't articulate clearly why she wanted to be president. I mean, getting on the 10 o'clock news and saying, why does Donald Trump want to be president? Well, he wants to build a wall, he wants to keep Muslims out, he wants to kind of treat veterans better, he wants to, do, you know, there were kind of things that were just clearly out there. And Hillary Clinton, there was a sense of entitlement, and she wasn't a very good candidate. But there was also a whole heap of misogyny bossy, she's shrill, she's manipulative, ambitious, ambitious, because no bloke is ever ambitious, no guy has ever gone and looked in the mirror and thought, God, I can see myself as the president one day. And so, so there were all sorts of impulses that I think Donald Trump was able to set off. And I think that Charlottesville could happen because of a lot of what Donald Trump, whether wittingly or unwittingly, and I think it's a really, really interesting question about whether, it, whether Donald Trump knew what he was doing or just didn't know what he it was doing. It's a really good question, answer it. Um, I, I, I honestly, I'm, I, I'm, not gonna be, I'm not gonna be all BBC tonight and kind of sure. hedge around it. I honestly don't know the answer to it. I honestly don't know the answer. I, if, if you're asking me about some of the people who supported uh, Donald Trump. So, if you're talking about uh, Steve Bannon, I think that he's very. Steve Bannon is a very clever guy. He's very well read. He's very conscious of what he's doing. I think Donald Trump probably didn't realise. I, you know, when he condemned both sides in Charlottesville, <coughs> making a moral equivalence between <laughs> anti-racism protesters and people holding swastikas, uh, he probably thought there was wrong on both sides. I mean, there are some of the sh some of some of what happened in Charlottesville was truly astonishing. I mean, you know, they're, they're holding torches, they are carrying swastikas. And America is a country that, you know, lost thousands of its young men on the, on the beaches of Normandy fighting the Nazis. And the idea that you could draw, you know, it seemed kind of historically extraordinary that you could draw an equivalence uh, between the two. And there were an awful lot of, and then Donald Trump then rode back. So on the Saturday, he said there was, uh, there was wrong on both sides. On the Monday, he is, reads this statement, and it's worth replaying it, because his hands are gripping the side of the lectern. He has clearly been told, you have got to state on every word that is written on that autos queue in front of you. And, and you can always tell a bad newsreader, and I was probably a lousy bad newsreader when I was doing it, but they're gripping the auto queue, and their eyes do not move at all because they're terrified they're going to lose their spot in the story. And you felt that watching Donald Trump reading this statement about, uh, it was the white supremacists, it was the Ku Klux Klan, it was, you know, neo-Nazis who were responsible. And then the next day, in Trump Tower, he completely goes back and says, no, there were really good people on both sides. Um, and I don't know whether he is conscious of what he's doing, whether he, is, he realizes he's giving a bit of a wink, you know, it's all right, guys, if you want to be a neo-Nazi, it's fine, don't worry, or whether he just hasn't thought it through. And I think there are bad people behind him who have thought it through. Um, and he got into a real mess. And Charlottesville, I mean, going back to, I mean, going back to what David was saying about the Reconstruction period in America, I mean, it's a fascinating period that you've got this period, which I talk about a bit in the book, where you get the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments, and suddenly it looks like it's, it's game over for racism in America. There are these hugely enlightened uh, kind of constitutional amendments get passed that allow black people to vote, that kind of, you know, they're, they're suddenly equal partners in society. And then you get the white supremacists, the Ku Klux Klan, you know, setting up outside polling stations saying, right, you've got to tell me how many bubbles there are on this bar of soap before you can come in to vote. Oh, you got that wrong. How many sweets are in the jar? Passing literacy tests. And what is really shocking about America in 2016, the 2016 election, there were three federal cases brought against states where, in effect, they were trying to do the same thing to drive down the black vote, and the court, the court cases were overturned. The, the, the way they tried to rewrite the electoral rules. So, for example, uh, you would limit the amount of early voting because they'd done research that said that all the early voting was done by black people who had, you know, didn't have as many cars and were less able to move around. And, you know, and it, was, it was pure racial profiling because they were terrified, correctly, that black people would vote Democrat. And so to find that you've still got an, 
there is still an echo, there is still a bit of the heartbeat, very faintly there, still in America, that would be recognisable if it was 100 years ago or 150 years ago. Well, see, this is the thing, uh, John, I'm wondering if it's not rather more than a heartbeat, and I say that as somebody who really doesn't like the business of kind of pointing a finger and giving somebody a label, because you don't kind of win arguments that way, and you obscure more than you, uh, more than you illuminate. But we were talking earlier about Trump's emergence onto the political scene with his espousal of the conspiracy theory about Barack Obama's birth certificate. And it is very hard to see that other than as a partly racial slur. Here's your first black president, and the point of accusation we make is it isn't really an American at all. Yes, from they was born in Kenya. Um, and it's... It looks in retrospect as if it's that message, which was completely disowned by all mainstream Republicans and so on uh, at the time, it's that message which actually first suggested to sections of the American right that Trump was their guy, uh, but also allowed people to say, yeah, because there were always 30%, 35% for, in polls for takers for that proposition. But the thing is, it is essentially a racialized proposition. Yeah. Then, there's the thing in Trump's biography um, uh, where he, uh, somebody remembers him talking about the characteristics of people working for him, how he fired a black bookkeeper because he said that blacks were actually were too lazy, really, to do the figures. If you wanted a bookkeeper, you got a, you got a Jew. That's what the person recollects. I don't remember that story ever being gainsaid. It is very simple baseline yeah. gut racism. And, yeah, I, I, you, you, there are all sorts of things about the, the birtherism movement, and, you know, even after Barack Obama produced his birth certificate, he didn't accept it, and then we were called to Trump Tower, the, no, not Trump Tower, to the new hotel, uh, the old post office building on Pennsylvania Avenue, which was, you know, Donald Trump in the middle of the campaign is doing a hotel opening, of course. Um, and, uh, and there was a one-line statement saying, I now accept that Barack Obama was born in the United States because it was expedient for the purpose of the election. It was, a kind of, it was a weight round his neck. He was never going to stop being asked about it unless he dealt with that particular issue uh, there and then. Can I, just, can I just pivot slightly to kind of sure. what, what I think is one of the... I mean, there was an, the Economist did a survey at Christmas. So after the election, a majority of Republicans still believe that Barack Obama wasn't born in the USA. A majority of Democrats still believe that uh, the, there, there was electoral interference by the Russians, i.e. they manipulated the ballot boxes. There is no evidence of that. People believe all sorts of weird and wonderful things. And I know that w when Britain went through the Brexit debate, there was this whole talk of you know, post-truth and Michael Gove very famously saying, you know, experts, who needs experts? Um, in the US election, what I found really terrifying and why I, f I find that my job at the moment is immensely challenging, but also an opportunity, is that we were just bathing in fake news, entirely fictitious stories. Now, some of which were uh, made up by, weirdly, uh, groups of young people in Macedonia who were producing clickbait. They got advertising revenue every time people clicked on a story that said Hillary Clinton uh, is paying money to ISIS to kill whoever, or, you know, I mean, just the most wild and wacky stories that you've ever heard of uh, were being uh, put up there. Some were put up by, act, you know, political actors. The Russians were putting stuff up there. And it would, and it would be in right-wing chat rooms. It would suddenly migrate to one of the uh, consolidator sites like Reddit. And then before you know it, it's in the political mainstream. And people are believing this stuff. Is it harmless? Is it harmful? Uh, I tell the story of this guy who walked into a pizza restaurant two miles from where I live with an AR-15 assault rifle, fires around and says, I've come to release the children. And he had believed that there was a paedophile ring run by Hillary Clinton, John Podesta, and the restaurant owner because they had talked about holding a fundraising dinner at this restaurant, and therefore they thought that the fundraiser was code for paedophilia. I mean, I'm, I, I promise you I'm exaggerating. I will I, it's all detailed. And... and he nearly caused a, you know, a massacre because he had believed this stuff. And what people do, and, you know, and so on the election day, so after election day, I, went, I was in New York 
uh, and I've been at Hillary Clinton's headquarters because I think, like a lot of people, there was an assumption that Hillary Clinton was going to win. And I did a, I did a, I did a piece to camera at Times Square. I get in a taxi, driven by an African American, and I'm listening to the radio. I say, it's all the news about the election. I say, "Oh, turn it up, please." And it's saying that uh, Hillary Clinton is just about to board her private jet uh, to go into exile in Qatar. Uh, she shipped off 1.6 billion dollars uh, to uh, the Bahamas and the Cayman Islands. I'm thinking, sorry, <laughs> this is. This is all complete and utter nonsense. What are you listening? And I asked the guy what he's listening to. And he justified it being truthful by repeating back to me all the other fake news stories that had come through an election. Now, I see that as, a, as terrifying and a real challenge to the BBC and to honest journalism. OK, which takes us to the last point before we, we, we go to the audience, which we promised ourselves that we would uh, discuss. Um, and it causes me... I can think, try and think my way through this more, more than anything else, because I don't see what the answer is. Um, a couple of American friends, and I was sitting down uh, the other day, and one of them said, oh, I said, uh, and he's a, 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 a left of center person, he said, the Democrats, he said, they're, you know, they're, they're useless, and, you know, uh, and I said to him, how would you know? Because nobody ever says anything about the Democrats. Nobody ever writes anything about the Democrats. Nobody puts a news item about the Democrats. Everything is Trump. Ever since he first stood in the primary elections, we, collectively, the media, have been mesmerized by nothing but Trump. We can scarcely, we get out for odd, we escape for odd moments, but he reels us back in like nobody's business. And as I was saying to you, in the, the New York Times, after they sent their three staff members to do this big interview with Trump, uh, one of them, who'd been with several presidents before, said, well, with Bill Clinton, you might get one story out of it if you were lucky, but on the whole, he'd just talk policy with you in kind of general, because he was really, really interesting. You have a lovely discussion, and you look at it at the end, and you think, I'm not sure I've got a story there. George W. Bush was very organized. He'd have a story for you, when you went, and that was the story you came out with. Um, Donald Trump had given us six stories in the first 25 minutes. Yeah. Six stories just straight. There they were. They could fill all the... And they did. What the hell are we going to do? Well, How do I'm, we not do this again? So, so, I mean, kind of... I can't tell you what it's like being at a Trump rally, and I've been to dozens uh, across America, because there will come a point, you know that it's coming, where, you know, so we are the press here, you're the audience, Donald Trump is over there. And we're the press filming Trump over there. And then there'll come a point in the speech where Trump will go, look at those people pointing at us, all the journalists on the riser. Have you ever seen a group of more dishonest people in your life? <laughs> they are disgusting, aren't they? And, 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 and I think, I'm thinking, I've done 30 years plus as a journalist where I have sought to tell the truth and to try to be fair and balanced and impartial. I'm being accused of all of this. By the end of the campaign, we had police on either end of the press riser to protect us from being attacked. And people were spat at, and people were punched for covering the campaign. And the, the ridiculous irony of this was brought home to me. Because, of course, during the primary process that David describes, if you are a television, the television director of a channel, and you have got a bank of, in your control room, you're going to have a bank of TV screens, and one of them has got Jeb Bush education policy. And the other one has got Marco Rubio, immigration. The other one has got Ted Cruz, tax reform. And the other one has got, jo got John Kasich, manufacturing. And the other one is going to have Donald Trump speaking in a minute. Which one are you going to go to? Donald Trump won every time. He didn't have to spend a fraction of the advertising revenue on ads that any of the other candidates did, because we covered him wall to wall, We, uh, the media because there was jeopardy. You didn't know whether he was going to pick a fight with anybody. And, and uh, you, you never knew what was going to happen next. And that was a compelling proposition. The TV networks couldn't resist taking as much Trump as it was possible to take at the expense of everybody else. Now, we've got different laws in this country about broadcasting and you know, the, the Representation of the People Act. The Broadcasting Act means that we, are, you know, we have to do things differently. And I think it is vitally important that we do things differently. And I think there is a huge challenge to journalism so that we do give a voice to other opinions that are out there in America. I, mean, I, I made a list of what had happened 
This is not, none of this is in the book. This is the last four weeks, and it reads like four years. You know, the new communications director is hired, Press Secretary Sean Spicer uh, it resigns. The Mooch, Scaramucci gives this obscene interview to the New Yorker magazine. Uh, Trump then fires the chief of staff. Then Scaramucci is fired less than 10 days into the job. Then Bannon is fired. Then Sebastian Gorka is fired. Jeff Sessions, the attorney general, is demeaned. Three Republican senators are demeaned for having voted against the health care bill that he lost. And I am just, I am down to there, and the list goes on for another two pages. And Rahm Emanuel, who was the Obama chief of staff, and is now the mayor of Chicago, said, I am going to nominate this White House for a, uh, a Tony Award for most drama. <laughs> Not best drama, most drama. And, and I think you're absolutely right. Donald Trump just wants drama. If there aren't the sounds of plates smashing and glasses being thrown against the wall, he is not happy. He could control it. He could uh, calm things down. But he wants to dominate every news cycle for good or bad, and he does. And I think it is an enormous challenge for us. I mean, I think one of the, you know, I was at the famous, well, it's now kind of moderately famous, relatively famous, the Saturday evening briefing, the night after inauguration, when suddenly there is a briefing called at the White House for the first time ever on a Saturday evening, and Sean Spicer stands up, refuses to answer a question from anybody, and, uh, and then he, uh, he proceeds to tell us that the crowds were bigger for Donald Trump's inauguration than at any other there had been in history. And you just had to look at the photo from the Washington Monument going back towards uh, the Capitol to realize that was arrant nonsense. And so the next day on the news, I found myself, and I kind of thought about it quite carefully. I said, it is demonstrably untrue that that is the case. So kind of on day one of the presidency, the BBC is more or less saying, but I think we have to. I think we, if there are lies told, I mean, I don't, I, we must point it out. But equally, it is not our job to be the opposition to Donald Trump. Let, polit let the Democrats be the opposition to Donald Trump. And there was an incident, Donald Trump gave this uh, rally that was uh, unorthodox, that's the best word I can think of, uh, the other week in Phoenix, Arizona. And at the end of it, the CNN presenter picked up, it cuts back to him in vision, and he went, well, that was unhinged. <laughs> what, what an embarrassment to America that he's our president. And I just thought, I, was wrong. I mean, I, I laughed as well. My instant reaction was to laugh. But it's wrong. We're, that's not our job. We are there to speak truth to power. We are there to hold power to account. We are there to point out when things go wrong. You're smirking at me, Aronovich. I'm, and I'm, I'm smirking, John, because these are our uh, virtuous cliches, um, um, which, we, which we say. Um, and they're right. But they don't work in this situation. They're not working. They're not working. You can, I mean, uh, in a domestic election, you're absolutely right about the level of uh, coverage you give Trump. But when we were covering Trump for the British market, we were less bad maybe than the Americans, but we were also bigger. And, and, that, was, and that was because we also knew the same thing. It was more newsworthy, what we call newsworthy. It gave you more news points. It meant you were discussing things that people easily understood, like arguments and rows and resignations, not policies and money and, and stuff like that, and, kind of, and aspirations which may or may not be able to be met. The kind of tedious business of democratic yeah. government disappears in the era of Trump. Well, you see, I don't think you can. I just don't think we can throw up our hands and say, right, it's war. And I think that we've got to keep on trying to report fairly and in a balanced way. And I'm not, I'm not on some kind of, B, you know, it's not the BBC chip that suddenly kind of activated in my arm that is uh, forcing me to say this. I do think we have to uh, do that. And at times we're going to have to call out untruth. I mean, let me put it to you like this. So when Donald Trump says of North Korea, if they do another test, it's going to be met with fire and fury, our weapons are locked and loaded. Now, I think that probably, there was, it was just rhetorical overload on Donald Trump's part. Are we going to normalize that to say, okay, well, we'll ignore it because that's just Donald Trump being Donald Trump? He's talking about nuking North Korea. You can't just say that's not a news story. That's a news story. And we have to, 
you know, I mean, there was, there was a great insight, I thought, during the campaign of one journalist, and I kind of, you know, when journalists come up with a really great phrase, you think, I wish I'd minted that. It was that the media have made the mistake of taking him literally and not seriously, where the public, the American public, take him seriously, but not literally. They take him seriously, they know that what he wants to do, but they, they know he tells lies and he exaggerates and he, you know, there are falsehoods around, but we take him seriously. Whereas the media just thought, oh, he can't get elected, look at that lie, look at what he said there, he's not releasing his tax returns. And of course, we, we, weren't, on, we weren't in the same place as much of the American public. But I think that if we take that council of despair, then we might as well pack up and go home and let the, you know, the fake news win. And I, I mean, I do despair about American news because I think that it's so polarized. And I think there is, you know, people are in such silos that they only echo. I mean, there's a friend of mine who works at the White House and he said that, uh, who, who worked in the Obama White House, and he was taking his son on a fishing trip to Alaska and they were driving for eight hours to get to where they were gonna go fishing. And he said, all I could find was right-wing radio stations. He said, by the time I got out of the car, I hated Hillary Clinton. You know, because, <laughs> you know, that's, if that's all you're being fed on. And people are just hearing their own views uh, reinforced. And I think that's potentially very dangerous. I, I, I think actually, at, at the moment, for all the challenges, there is some really good journalism taking place in America, and the investigative work that's being done is, uh, and actually, for every time that Donald Trump says the failing New York Times, their digital subscriptions go up. And, and you know, CNN, actually, their viewership is going up um, because they're making a market out of yeah. being the opposition to Trump. And talking about him. And talking about him. Yeah, yeah but, but, you know, I think that some of it... Do I think that Donald Trump will get elected? I don't know. I mean, I, I re-elected, I think it's perfectly possible. He could serve eight years. But I think that he is finding the challenges. I mean, I think so far the US Constitution is standing up pretty well. I think the judiciary is standing up and doing its job. I think the legislature is doing its John, job. if the US Constitution was standing up properly, the bastard would be impeached by now. <laughs> Any other person would have been impeached by now. If the Republicans were doing their job, then he'd be in impeachment uh, proceedings right now. Impeachment, because it is whatever Congress says it is, there's a kind of problem. And meanwhile, well, let, let's see what happens. At, let's see what happens when Mueller finishes report, and you know whether there was obstruction of justice, because a, you know, and what where it goes. I mean, the, the wheels are turning. And remember, you know, people kind of think that Watergate happened overnight. It didn't. It was a very, very slow burn. And as, as Bill Clinton found out when Ken Starr was, you know, Ken Starr started his investigation, it was into a property deal called Whitewater. It then became about everything else and perjury and Monica Lewinsky and all the rest of it. So these things can burn pretty slowly. So, you know, who knows where we'll end up? True. Okay, right, enough of me, um, but not enough of John and something of you. We have two mics on either side. John's going to help me locate who he wants uh, to ask a question and so I'm on. So, but somebody's going to have to be first. Yes. And that is that, that person that, there. That, the person oh, we there. Agree. Yeah, a person there, and then there's one at the back, hand up, sitting down okay. in the cheap seats. Yeah. Can I ask about how you choose the language that you use when you're, when you're reporting on this extraordinary, unprecedented, unusual administration? How do you strike the balance between conveying to us, the viewers, quite how unusual all this is, but still leave yourself the rhetorical room knowing that there's crazier yet to come so you haven't exhausted all the superlatives straight out of the world? It's <laughs> a great question. Uh, when David and I worked together in uh, politics, there was a sort of old cliche that, you know, what you do in, in your piece to camera is you'd say, Joe Blog says A, but Fred Splinge says B, only time will tell. I don't think we have got the right to be boring over Donald Trump. And I think we do have the license to just occasionally uh, arch an eyebrow which I will do and I try to do in my pieces so that they are pointed, you know, that they're not just a recitation of facts, this one says this, this one says the other. Um, and so, you know, I, I flew back from America at the, at the weekend and because of the North Korea suddenly escalating uh, situation, I got called in to do the 10 o'clock news on Sunday night. And I thought, you know, I do think quite, I mean, I don't rehearse what I'm gonna say, but I, I think what's the argument I want to make? And you want to put it in a, punchy way and I you know I said you know look there may be back channels open with North Korea there may be talks going on but at the moment 
what we have is a North Korea whose military capability is accelerating dramatically, and a president who says the time of talking is over. And that's not exactly ideal. And you know, so I think you can say those sort of things without falling foul of editorial guidelines. And I think we do have to be uh, pugnacious and, uh, and say things in a kind of interesting way. And, that's, and, and the, the other night when I said that actually I was, I was sent down uh, to Texas to cover the Houston floods. Actually, Houston, Houston was a really, I thought, you know, and I covered Hurricane Katrina 12 years ago. This is a kind of, I'm just taking myself on a, off on a byway now. Actually, Houston showed the best of America. I thought there were really good examples of communities coming together, whereas I thought New, New Orleans was absolutely catastrophic, where, you know, in the lower ninth district of New Orleans, it, it was just the black people who were left behind, and there were no whites there to be seen. Anyway, that was my sort of uh, aside in response to Charlottesville being terrible. Houston was actually what America could be. Um, but I think we've got to use language that is fair and appropriate. But after Houston, I said Donald Trump had done well. And all, and the, the Trump, the people who on Twitter who think that I'm a, kind of just a terrible human being and just out and a typical liberal lefty BBC whatever, nothing could be further from the truth. Um, that uh, that you know, oh God, so you're nice, yeah. When things are good, you say they're good. When things are bad, call them as bad. But don't just be kind of vanilla and banal and plain in the middle, because I think that is makes for really dull journalism. Okay, I liked the response of the atomic scientist to the recent North Korea um, uh, atom test, who simply tweeted two minutes after he'd heard it, oh fuck. Which we kind of thought was quite interesting. Again, again, not a word that I am able to use. Actually, sorry, okay, you, you, him saying that. There were, I mean, the unorthodoxy of the president. But I rang Downing Street the night I was in a restaurant in Georgetown, there was a, an, uh, and Donald Trump tweeted that Nigel Farage ought to be the next ambassador, uh, <laughs> Britain's next ambassador to Washington. So I rang up the British Embassy in DC and said, uh, have you seen this? And they said, no, but this is way, way, way above my pay grade to comment on. You're going to have to speak to Downing Street to get a comment on this. And, uh, and so I rang Downing Street, and it was, you know, 9.30, 10 o'clock in the evening in Washington, so 3 o'clock in the morning when the poor duty press officer was woken up by me. And uh, I, told them what the du I told the duty press officer what Trump had said. He said, oh, fuck, he hasn't, has he? And I thought... <laughs> So how do I transla translate that for the Radio 4 Morning Bulletin? I, I said there was a shocked reaction. <laughs> <laughs> Who was the next one? <laughs> yeah. For those of us who do want to um, work for the crooked news media, or the fake news media, or whatever it is it's being referred to fake now. Fake news. Your fake news. <laughs> yeah, okay. Um, how do you think that the attitude towards the media is going to go in the coming years? Because, I mean, as this, in the same way that some people think that, that Trump was a reaction to Obama, do you think that actually the kind of the, the attack on the media might actually get some people on side and it might swing back the other way? Or do you think it's going to keep getting worse in the terms of people's, people's reaction to, to kind of the mainstream media, if you will? Uh, so, uh, John, before you answer, let me say, if you answer at the same length you did the last one, this is the last question. Um, I think there's a danger of that. I hope it doesn't come to that. I think that our journalism has got to be rigorous and has got to be tough. Um, and, you know, actually things like Houston help because, of course, the news media played a vital role in informing people where the dangers were. And, you know, we've got to fight for our place in the sun. And my worry about fake news and all that charge and all that comes out of it is that politicians are not going to think, Fake news, isn't it terrible? It doesn't work. They're going to look at Donald Trump's victory and think, fake news is fabulous. Let's do more of it. And that's something that journalism has got to fight against if we're going to have a well-informed public, and which is vital for a vibrant democracy. That was a short answer. Is that good? See, that? I'm, I'm trained. You want a 40-second answer? I'll it give were, you a 40-second uh, answer. Did you see it click in there? I clicked straight I felt, in. I felt guilty. I really did, but I, I was telling the truth. Um, yes, for the gentleman at the front here, Hi. and then we'll take somebody over. I'm good. How are you doing? I'm well. Um, I wonder, on that subject, can uh, the U.S. go back to a really fair and open political process, or will it be co-opted by uh, going back to fake news and just telling a bunch of lies and and uh, being a populist candidate? I, I don't know. I mean, I think that, you know, look, we're, at, we're seven months in, eight months into a Trump presidency. Um, I mean, I think there are structural problems, which is a huge issue to get into when David Aronovich is going to be saying, telling me to shut up, um, about 
you know, the way money is, drives politics and you can't run an election campaign without huge amounts of it, and that means you're doing deals with all sorts of people and you're having to, you know, tailor your message accordingly. Um, and also you have got, you know, the, the real elections that matter are the primaries, not the actual elections themselves, because all the electoral districts have been so gerrymandered now that there is very little, very few seats that change hands. So I think there are big structural problems. But you know what? I kind of loved it. I mean, who would have thought that, you know, Bernie Sanders calling for a revolution would be, get as much traction as it did? A right-wing populist like Donald Trump would get as much traction as he did. I mean, I thought American democracy seemed pretty vibrant and pretty quarrelsome, uh, which is often a sign of a healthy democracy. And, and so, uh, you know, I don't want to go into a council of despair over it just yet. Yeah, who'd have thought that the winning candidate would get three million votes less than the losing candidate? Oh, uh, that's a cheap point. That's an electoral college, and I think that <laughs> Donald Trump is absolutely right to say, you know what, I played by the rules of the electoral college. No, 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 no actually, John, we'll have this argument, other I think it's very far from a cheap point. It actually, there's a very it's significant expensive. problem uh, in the American system oh, yeah, because, of, course. because, because, of, the gives, way, because of the way it's working sure. demographically. Yeah. Um, and it's going to get worse and worse and worse because the populations of New York David, and I thought we were listening to other people, not each other. Yeah, well, <laughs> don't accuse me of a cheap shot and expect to get away with it. Um, oh, loads of hands. This is great. Come on. Okay, you've got to pick one last one. Oh, you, no, yeah. not one last yeah, one. You, one let's, last do one. Two, let's do two or three. Okay, I'm going to tell you. The gentleman there, uh, come down sort of here. The gentleman there. And the lady there See, and the guy there. And we'll do the three is, really quickly. This is Trump politics. He knows perfectly well we're supposed to end at 7.30. <laughs> we have one and a half minutes in which to fit these other four questions. They're going to be There's really quick them. questions. Shut up and then we'll get the questions in. <laughs> what do you think influences Donald Trump's thinking more and White House policy more? Is it Donald Trump and his personality and his ego? Or do you think he's actually quite influenced because of his political inexperience um, by his advisors? Okay, um, right, let's move the microphone along. That's good. Who was the next person they wanted to do? Yeah, you, sir, and then this lady here. Oh, no, you can... You, no, she's got... Go on, you take it back. Go on. I'm, I'm, um, if there's no precedent for this president, which character would you compare Donald Trump to, either real or fictional? Is the okay. Any questions, final no question? question that is, yeah, go on, sir. In answer to the question, were you being led by the nose by following or speaking about Trump's induced stories, you said, how can you not report upon bombing North Korea, etc.? Do you think the established media are cowed a bit by fear of being sidelined by social media by not being in the fray? Right. Great question. I'm not sure what Donald Trump really believes or whether everything is a deal and a negotiation. I think he has got instincts. I think he is very hard to dissuade from those instincts that, and they are normally about kind of how America is being laughed at, whether it's in trade deals, whether it's about the climate change arrangements, and, and I think it takes a lot to dislodge him from it. I heard a kind of fascinating thing about, you know, from one of the very, very senior people in the administration when asked after Charlottesville, why do you stay? And the reply was, you don't know the madness we've stopped. So that was kind of an interesting and telling uh, response. Uh, I'm still, I'm going to come to you last because I haven't thought of the answer yet. Um, remind me, the question was oh, about the media and... Sidelined by social media. Be part of yeah, the I mean, look, Is it every, every, every politician I've ever reported has wanted to sideline the media. Every politician I've ever known. I mean, you know, go back to FDR, and I know it's an odd comparison, but FDR invented the fireside chat. People in mean, their millions bought radio sets so that they could hear from FDR directly and his views weren't being mediated by the media. So I think the ambition has always been there. And with Donald Trump, he's got the ability to deliver that with 34, 35 million Twitter followers and uh, huge followings on Facebook. So yeah, I think they are trying to cut out the media as much as possible. But I think that the media is actually trying to put a very good fist on it. God, I mean, uh, I, Donald Trump, the character, who, who does he compare you most to in fiction? I, I, that is a dangerous one for me to get into. All I would say is that the latest season of House of Cards has done really, really badly because it just seems pale and anemic <laughs> and dull next to what is really happening in real life.
proof, if you need it, that old media can sideline anybody at any time. Um, uh, John will be signing copies of his book downstairs. He and I would like to thank you very much, yes. both for being here and for some really excellent questions, which thank I should you. have left more time for, um, uh, and I apologise for not having done that. Um, but I would like to join with you, I think, in uh, appreciating John very much for being here this evening. Thank you very much. Thank you.